just about ready to begin with our second speaker of the afternoon. We're going to switch gears now from the French to the Irish. Certainly anyone that was around last weekend knows that uh, we certainly know how to celebrate our Irish connection to the century, even if you don't have any Irish connection at all. Because we had three day celebrations here last week for the uh, Sarah Sea Association's anniversary. So we're certainly out in all of our, all of our green and flying the Ireland flag last week. Now we're uh, pleased to have uh, our second speaker join us this afternoon, and that of course is Anne St. Croix. And Anne's interest in Newfoundland Labrador culture goes back to her family's influence. Born in St. Vincent, St. Mary's Bay, and raised in St. John's, she spent summers in her mother's home of Trinity. And history, geography, and cultural events were part of home and communities. Research and company work as a tour guide throughout the province raised her interest and encouraged further experiences in education. Anne became familiar with Placentia, the islands of Placentia Bay, and the Cape Shore during her employment with Destination St. John's and through friendships created here in the region. Uh, Anne is going to use Google Earth technology and other forms of interpretation and multimedia to share the research she has done. And this research, drawn from the work of uh, Dr. John Mannion and others, lends insight to the influence that the Sweetman family, of course, Sweetman's from New Bond, County Wexford in Ireland, had on the settlement, as well as the social and cultural elements of the Placentia area, Cape Shore, and the islands of Placentia Bay. Given the information gathered on family surnames, and has followed the ways of Irish immigrants to Placentia, along with Cape Shore, and onto the islands of Placentia Bay, as initiated by Please join me in welcoming Anne for the presentation. with both the town of Placentia, um, Cyril and all, all of the other people here, and Tom O'Keefe and Lee, and so it's like coming home. Um, work, I, uh, my background is in education and training, and uh, I'm never far from that. I always think everything's about curriculum development. <laughs> uh, and that comes through in my work as a tour guide, uh, which I do in between other paid jobs, and. Um, I do uh, mostly the Avalon. I'm very familiar with the Avalon and the Trinity Bon Vista area, as you would expect. But I do take tours um, up as far as southern Labrador, uh, Red Bay. Um, I probably followed Amanda's route in archaeology, uh, Fort Chua, all the way down. I've taken the ferry along the south coast, uh, an arduous trip at best. Uh, left only for the young and healthy. <laughs> I think it aged me a little, but fabulously beautiful. So I do, uh, since returning to Newfoundland 16 years ago, it's mostly been around tourism culture and tourism, uh, economic development around tourism. Um, the origin of uh, this project that I worked on um, sort of started um, with my volunteer work with what was once the Festival of the Sea, now the Irish, Newfoundland, um, I think it's Newfoundland and Labrador Irish uh, Connections Board, and some members are here, Gary is, is here today, and um, so I think it was a year and a half ago that they received some funding to undertake some research projects in the Southern Avalon. And, um, Michael Mooney then was working, and still is until next week, with the Avalon Gateway Development Board. And uh, they were uh, put out some calls and um, some responses, but other people were working different jobs, and I said, I can do that. <laughs> and it was quite a time for me, so I always like to do that kind of thing. So, um, and the first part of that um, project was writing a report. Um, well, I looked at it as a reading report. Um, so I didn't know what aspect to take for a short little project of research. Uh, a, a short time, I mean, uh, about two or three months. So I came, I talked to some people around, and I came to the town of Placentia and spoke with Margie Hatfield and Anita O'Keefe. 
and said, is there anything that you would like to see done that hasn't been done? You know, some, something that could be done in a short time. I wasn't uh, looking at the length of time Amanda took to gather her research. And I certainly didn't want to um, uh, be a field worker in archaeology. So, um, although that would have been really fun in my earlier years, I would have, I think that would have been my choice. So, um, there were several things came up um, uh, around Placentia that were sort of left hanging. And it was Marty Hatfield who said, you know, I always um, wanted to tie the research in Sweetman family that's here with um, the people like McCasey in Ireland, Wexford, have all of their information there. Is there any way we can tie the two together? So I said, let me look at it. And the first thing that was handed me was uh, uh, Dr. John Mannion's Irish Merchants Abroad piece. And I looked at that and I thought, OK, that's manageable. Because it not only talked about the Irish coming here, um, Sweetman, and before him, Saunders and Welch, but how um, Sweetman's sending of the um, the laborers up to Cape Shore, so it, it, and the islands of of uh, Placentia Bay, so it included not just Placentia but had a little bit more scope. So I decided, okay, this is really good, and it's something I can tie in. So I did that, and the parameters of of that research um, dealt with fishing and farming, politics, religion, and a, a few other things like that, which was the scope. And of course, the fishing and farming was included through the Sweetmans and Cape Shore Farms, and politics uh, and religion um, I included as well. And the only thing that was really left out was women and women's work. And I'm... Um, the, the lack of um, information and documentation, um, it, it is there. You have to dig around to find it, and I found some very good sources. But I'm not going to go into that so much today because uh, of time commitments. Um, and But I will give you some references to have a look and see where to find out that information and other information. Um, the women's work here in Placentia, Fairyland I'm familiar with, and, um, and we've all heard the stories. So I think that brings me up to, to where I am now. And I've just had uh, new lenses in my eyes that are fabulous. I can see all of you up there, and I can read most of it, but I'll rely on reading glasses once in a while. And if you'll be a little bit patient with me, because I'm using Google Maps, and um, I, I really did hesitate to draw in that. I first started that through the second phase when the research money, there was a little bit more money. So I thought, OK, what would I do in the second phase outside of this little report I wrote? And uh, I noticed I've been doing some other things around tourism looking at virtual tours, how a handheld app, uh, device could have an application for song and dance and music of an area that would bring some life to a community. And I'd already been working at another project with um, Newfoundland Statistical Agency, Dr. Doug May, on branch, uh, recording the culture and history, uh, other, and, and measuring community well-being outside of gross domestic product. So I was looking at all of that, how we could use uh, technology to, to show somebody a town when they came in. They could have music, you could have recitations, you can have old maps, you can have photographs, and all of those things that make it more interesting from a visitor. And being in the tourism industry, um, I try to uh, not just show people around, uh, although that's very important and we have such beautiful things to show people, but how to enjoy the culture. So, um, culture and genealogy go back there. So I, I set up a, 
a little Google map presentation myself, struggled through it and uh, put text in and things like that. And I went to Michael Mooney, my colleague and friend, and of course he has a background in this. Um, he has a background in this and uh, I have lost connection. I probably pushed it. So he thought he could uh, do it a little bit finer, make the balloons a little smaller, use Dropbox. I still don't know how to use Dropbox, but he has. And I don't think it's really hard. Anyway, so it, from, uh, from my primitive beginnings in this idea, um, you will see uh, somewhat more perfected form. So, if we look at this, um, we're not going to delve really deeply into every Mooney, Nash, Foley on the southern shore, on the Cape Shore, but it, it's more of a, a story of how all of this happened. So, there's, it's another way to look at genealogy other than just the family tree and who came. What is the story about all of this? How did they get here? And um, if I, if I was Dale Jarvis, I might uh, have interviews and things like that here today because he does uh, workshops in this, which one of those days I will take. Uh, from, from right here on the beach, a hundred years after uh, Amanda's story, uh, and she tells me that the, uh, the English and the British didn't come in in dribs and drabs, they came in by a boatload. And um, into about 1730, right here in this place, uh, Richard Welch had already been fishing. He fished for 20 years here before he went into the mercantile trade. By 1770, William Saunders, Welch's son-in-law, took over. 1785, Pierce Sweetman began his apprenticeship with Saunders. And in 1788, just about 100 years almost to the day uh, from Amanda's story, uh, Pierce Sweetman became the manager and eventual um, major shareholder, uh, the Sweetman family, of the company Saunders and Sweetman. So that is where we are sort of starting, and I will sort of trace them backwards, starting in New Bonn, County Wexford. It's a bit of a disclaimer here in that uh, the little question box, the little box in the middle here, uh, gives my references and my sources. And this is the kind of thing you can do with Google Earth, to use a spatial representation of either your family, uh, whether they've moved on to California, Boston states, or Alberta. Uh, you can connect all of those, and it's very simple to do, especially if somebody with a little technology. Um, and right here, if you were saying, I would like to read John Mannion's paper, you can click on here, Irish Merchants Abroad, the Newfoundland Experience 1750 to 1850. Um, some, some of the others, um, Point Lance in Transition. So if, that, if there's anything at all on the internet, you can connect right here and read it. Um, this is the one uh, when I talked about women, uh, women and women's work in the Southern Avalon. Uh, this has uh, been the one that I have used by Willine Keong. It was the basis of her master's thesis that uh, is now a book. It's called The Slender Thread. Um, and it's um, well worthwhile, very informative. It does have some mention of Placentia, but mostly it's a Southern shore. Um, an account of women's work on the southern shore. But it, it was quite, they were Irish women as well, so we, uh, I think it's comparable. 
The other work um, that I used, although it was in 1950, almost a hundred years later, is this one uh, from the 1950s. And people of my generation might know about this, and it was uh, in the Bonavista Bay, I think at Elliston and along those, um, women's, woman's life um, in a Newfoundland outport, 1900 to 1950, more than 50%. And this is Hilda Chalk Murray, also uh, formed her, uh, from her thesis on the same subject. And uh, you might notice, and those of us who have been there, there was very little difference in the work in that hundred years, I'd say. And the others, the others are um, Laval and the uh, Town of Placentia websites, you can click on there. So I just wanted to give this little, little disclaimer. Um, I have seen Dr. Mannion, um, many times, not many times, four or five times, he knows that I've taken this work of his and um, I was a little nervous when I first uh, brought it to him, but he was quite interested in doing it and as most academics, very interested that this information can get out and around on, on, on any level that people get to read it and get to see it and be useful. about the introduction, so I put it in the middle of the Atlantic. <laughs> and essentially it's just what I told you. Richard Welsh came, fished here, uh, set up a, a mercantile fishery business. Uh, he was joined by William Saunders from uh, West Country, England. Uh, as most of you know, there was quite a mix of English, um, Irish, and Jerseymen um, here in that, during that time. Uh, unlike maybe the Southern Shore, we're mostly Irish. So th that's the introduction leads you to this. We're going to start in Ireland, in New Bonn, County Wexford. And I'm going to stay on this site a little while to show you some of the possibilities that you could bring to this. Um, the Sweetman uh, were farmers in New Bonn. They, um, the first Pierce Sweetman in the 1700s after Cromwell uh, started to clear land uh, in New Bonn. And that land uh, that was cleared to eventually uh, 347 acres. So, and that was shared up among his sons and uh, we will look at that. So, um, Pierce and Elizabeth from 1700. Now you'll notice, as it is in most families, we're all named for, uh, for our grandmothers and grandfathers, so uh, appear, the name Pierce appears several times. So Pierce married Elizabeth Downs, and their sons Michael, Nicholas, Patrick. And a daughter who's unnamed, uh, she married a man named Stafford. You'll see the name Stafford come up in Oporto in Spain uh, eventually, so I think she was connected to that house. It'll show you their reach. So it's really Michael, the oldest son, who we're going to follow, his, his, uh, his, uh, his family. And uh, he, his oldest son, Roger, um, was granted uh, or had a piece of land at Ferry near New Bonn and married Mary Welch from Placentia. And it's this son, the grandson of the first Pierce, that we are going to follow, who came to Placentia as an apprentice to the firm of William Saunders. So that's all linked there. 
Um, any kind of local uh, entertainment in there uh, from your community. You could show uh, discussions or meetings, dances, uh, any of those things. So, this is an old map, and I'm not sure how, how old it is, but you can have these, um, this sort of thing from the, the old surveys, old survey maps uh, at, that you can download uh, and use to, uh, to follow. Um, here is New Bonn right here, and New Bonn, New Bonn House right over here. Now, I'm going to zoom in here a little bit further so that you can actually see not just the old, not just the old map, I don't want to make you seasick. bring it right down to see the farms uh, of New Bonn as they are today, right now, if you, if you so desire. And uh, you often wonder how they, how they managed over here at all, uh, because there, it's, you couldn't see a bit of water except probably the river shore as it flowed by the back of Blenheim Lodge. Um, so it, it isn't coming up here now, and I'm not sure why. Um, but we'll, we'll proceed rather than hold, hold this up. Now we, we talked about uh, some of the other sons. Patrick, born in 1705, married a Wexford woman and traveled throughout England and Europe as a merchant in the wine trade. So you can see how far their, um, how far their reach was. Um, Roger, um, Roger Sweetman granted ferry by his father. Uh, he built a large house and became a free man of Ross in 1786. He was not involved directly with the Newfoundland trade. His eldest son, Pierce, was sent to Poole, uh, then to Placentia to learn the trade in the firm of William Saunders. Uh, we, we can enlarge this image. And there's the house at Ferry. So you, you can access, the, these, um, these uh, pictures and maps are from Dr. Mannion's private collection, uh, with his permission. Uh, he's happy to have them out there and useful to people. So uh, the, this, this was the, the estate at Ferry, which was Roger's, Roger's home. The very famous Nicholas, who uh, was also the son of Pierce, graduated in Salamon Salamanca, Spain, and became Bishop of Ferns. Again, you can see their, um, their um, connections to the Iberian Peninsula, both 
as wine merchants and for education and all, all kinds of connections. So they were well connected really to be involved in the fishery it, um, because those con early connections were with uh, the Iberian Peninsula. became the pivot of the triangular trade network that included Iberia, Poole, Waterford, and Placentia. You can embed links in here. If you didn't know what Iberia was or where it was, you can go into a Wikipedia and learn a little bit more about that. Uh, if you wanted to um, learn about the fishery there, you could read that and its European context or any other con contact. You can enlarge the picture of um, Blenheim House in Poole. Most of the houses were uh, all called Blenheim. Blenheim here in Placentia, Blenheim in Poole, and Blenheim Lodge uh, just outside of Waterford. Um, and you can read about Poole in, in Wikipedia as well. So anything you want to put in there, you can put in. Uh, the next uh, important part of that trade is Waterford. And this is um, Blenheim House in Waterford. And it's not necessarily the house I wanted to put in, just to show you the land uh, of, of around the house, around Blenheim, Blenheim Lodge. The trees were certainly bigger than Placentia's. <laughs> and I think in the distance there, um, you can see, see the houses as well. So um, the possibilities for all of that are there. And again, um, New Ross, uh, we, can, we can look at New Ross. I don't have pictures there of New Ross yet. Uh, it's the home of Richard Welsh, who in 1759 was the leading merchant in Placentia and the founder of the company that later owned and managed the Sweet, uh, was owned and managed by the Sweetman family. It was the center of the Wexford part of the trade, although never a big part. It, um, uh, there was a small but independent um, connection here, uh, trade with passengers and provisions. Oh, can I do that again? I'm sorry about this. I usually have somebody to help manage both of it. here now to, to show us uh, how this worked. On this side over here we have Placentia, uh, we have in Ireland we have counties Wexford and uh, Waterford, Kilkenny, Cork. In the, in the um, United Kingdom we have uh, Poole at this point. And here on the Ibernian Peninsula, we had Oporto, Malaga, um, the Mediterranean, uh, Karuna, all of those ports that uh, serviced. So the triangular part of this involves um, a vessels um, leaving southern Europe right here uh, with dried cod. Um, up to um, Poole and on to Waterford for supplies, provisions, and laborers. There were always laborers on the wharf at, um, in Waterford to come over for a, a summer or two summers and a winter at the first, at the beginning, and then later staying on, and into Placentia. The other thing that happened when they came back from Placentia in the fall, they brought cod oil, and uh, into Portugal, 
picked up salt for the winter uh, for the following spring's fishery up to pool where they overwintered with the salt and in the spring brought brought it to Placentia. The fishery began uh, the herring fishery began uh, about the first of April uh, for bait uh, for the fishery to begin almost as early as the first of May uh, for cod. They um, they steamed to the Grand Banks and Quebec. Uh, and later on, um, from Placentia down to my area, uh, past Cape St. Mary's, uh, past Cape St. Mary's, Cape, Cape Pine, and all in that area. Which is probably how the San Croix got from Jersey side in Placentia over to St. Vincent's. Uh, I, I didn't uh, know until I started this that I was actually from Placentia, way back in the 1700s. Uh, so um, I knew they, uh, my ancestors came from Jersey in the Channel Islands, but uh, I found through Dr. Mannion and his work that uh, they actually set up a planter station here on, at, in Jersey side. So I do belong here. Now, um, 1788, which is again 100 years, uh, which is the only time we're going to think of this small capsule of, of um, laborers that came over. Um, we'll look at them and follow them because they're the ones we're, we're most interested in. In 1788, 1,000 men came to Placentia to work. 1,000 came over from England and Ireland. One quarter of those thousand were Irish. Uh, and that this is the group we will follow. So the Irish laborers came and worked for Saunders and Sweetman, or, or, or the planters uh, and that were uh, also supplied by Sweetman. Um, and they fished in the, uh, fished in the summers and in the winter, especially through uh, the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, uh, they couldn't travel back and forth with, for provisions or even go to Boston, or uh, they could be gang, uh, press gangs and pirates of one kind and another. So uh, Saunders and Sweetman or, um, decided um, to use those same laborers, those fishing laborers, to build vessels, build ships in the winter time. Uh, so in 1788-89, uh, Saunders and Sweetman built two ships in Placentia, and uh, 400 men uh, stayed over that winter to build. Um, during the winter, they cut wood uh, for lumber for boats and housing and fishing structures. Uh, they worked at repairing nets and making barrels. So they were fairly skilled uh, as well. You know, they they brought um, they brought skills with them. They weren't uh, they weren't without some donation to the cause, and they worked for they were called dieters, and I suppose dieters because they worked for food and shelter. And it is spelled like dieter. I guess that's where we all got into all these fads on diets. <laughs> Um, in uh, 1792, uh, Pierce became the director uh, of uh, the Sweetman Company. And they started uh, looking to, uh, during uh, the French Re uh, the Napoleonic Wars particularly, looking to St. John's and Boston for provisions. Um, and uh, I guess he must have gotten the bright idea. We've been cutting lumber uh, up the Cape Shore and into the islands of Placentia Bay. Uh, there's good land there. Why don't we uh, raise our own food and uh, livestock and cut down on all this travel back and forth? So, um, because of that, Sweetman uh, was responsible for settlement on the Cape Shore and the islands. Um, between 1800 and 1840, laborers sent to raise, were sent to raise cattle and crops. Uh, for planters and workers in the population of Placentia. So, over three decades, 50 Irish families established uh, farms 
along the Cape Shore. Um, and the majority of those were um, laborers and immigrants brought from Waterford by Sweetman vessels. I'm just going to read a little something that uh, from Dr. Mannon's Over the next three decades, some 50 families, 50 Irish families, established farms along the Cape Shore. The vast majority immigrants transported on Sweetman vessels from Waterford or their descendants. Several served for a period as shoremen, shoremen in Placentia prior to taking up land and retained close commercial ties with company headquarters. Like planters in the fishery, they were supplied by Sweetmans on the promise, promise of agricultural produce for the fall. A, new, a few farms were managed initially by Sweetman servants. Brulee, Pointford, Parishway, Pointlands, Marticot. But most were owned from inception by their occupiers. Others purchased later as the Sweetman that dynasty declined. So, um, Dr. Manning reports that as early as 1826, the average family on the Cape Shore kept nine cattle, a horse, two sheep, and three pigs. So, wasn't wasn't a very big enterprise. And I have just a quick question on that. When you refer to the Cape Shore, are you referring to Point Bird? As, as we had this discussion for branch or services, we'll be stopping at Package Grove or some Bride before the, the branch. Uh, stopping at um, Point Lance between Point, uh, Placentia and Point Lance. Uh, that's, uh, I, I did check that. <laughs> uh, Branch has a bit of a different history, as most of us know, especially if you know anybody from Branch. It, it's a, a quite a definite different history, but I, I will bring that up a little bit. Um, the earliest of the farmers uh, was um, John Lamb from Point Ferd. I'm going to zoom in again now. I know I don't do much of this because um, it's really not set up. So, um, again, uh, you, uh, ju this is just a link. If you've forgotten, for example, the family tree and who's who, you can go back there and look again. Or if you want to hear Kevin Collins sing, you can link back in. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe I can get a little bit of sound of this because I have something at the end I want to say. So, uh, and here we have this old picture of uh, this. I really like this one of Placentia. Certainly not Sweetman time, but it's it's one of the nicer ones. It shows shows the architecture very nicely, doesn't it? Look at the, look at the roofs. I don't know how many of those still remain. No, actually, that picture is reversed. Is it reversed? Yeah. Well, yes. The little okay. house should be on the opposite side of the road. Okay, turn it around. <laughs> it's still there, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's backwards, I guess. Yeah. So you can, you can put in uh, any number of pictures and links in here that that will show you. I think it would be a nice way to do for, for Amanda to put her. <laughs> She'd just love for me to give her another job. <coughs> um, so uh, we're going to zoom in a little bit now into Placentia and the Cape Shore. I'm, hope, I'm hoping this will come up. Maybe I'm out in the ocean a bit. But Davis straight for heaven's sakes. You see all those little pins I have? <coughs> I want to show you those. Each 
of those pins represents um, a, a cove on the Cape Shore. Um, so the earliest farmer was um, was John Lamb, um, and he had 15 acres uh, there at Point Bird. So that's really quite uh, quite interesting. Uh, quite a large farm. Um, probably the largest on, on the Cape Shore. I might have this wrong. Uh, John Lamb from Point Verde, he went to Big Barishway, probably the oldest farm on the Cape Shore, 15 acres. Sweetmans eventually um, bought uh, that land in Barishway and sent Patrick O'Keefe there as a manager with ten, up to 10 laborers. So that was, that was the largest one. Um, a handful of farmers, their wives, sons, daughters, formed the nucleus of settlement between Placentia and Point Lance. Branch has a different uh, bit, bit of history there. It was uh, in the 1700s settled by Thomas Nash, who came by way of Calvert on the southern shore, or Capelin Cove, as it was called then. And uh, later, by, uh, he was joined by Patrick Roach from the Sweetman firm. All the way down, uh, you, you'll have, um, you could have uh, stories of each of the families. Uh, so from John and Robert Green in Point Verde, to Thomas Foley in Little, in Little Barishway, to Patrick O'Keefe in Great Barishway, Tobin and Scary in Ship Cove, Doyle in Gooseberry Cove, James Coffey in Angel's Cove, uh, Barclay McGraw in Patrick's Cove, uh, Conway uh, to St. Bride's, uh, Kareen, of course, to Point Lance, and um, Nash, who came first, but not through the Sweetmans, and later Roach and the Moonies and McGraws and you know all the names, English, one of the earliest ones. As, as an example, I'm going to show you uh, Angel's Cove, because Eddie Coffey is not from there. <laughs> I, was t I was told, <laughs> I, had to, I was thinking Coffey, Coffey Angel's Cove, so he's actually from Coslet. But we had a really nice picture of Angel's Cove. And uh, you can do this. You can also put some of the ancestors' uh, pictures in there if you like. You could put uh, um, uh, grandparents' pictures or family pictures, uh, and there's really quite, uh, no real end to it. Uh, can anybody go in and do that? Uh, they will be uh, able to do it as soon as it's shared, as uh, soon as it's all completed, all the pictures are in. And I've also thought, do we have to wait till all the pictures are in? Because some people might, some people say from Patrick's Cove might want to put in what they like to do. Um, and it could belong to a community. It could belong to anybody. Uh, right now, uh, two of us are sharing it uh, just to build it. But as you see, it's just about completed. And um, if, if indeed it can be, it, when it is shared, uh, it can be available on Google Earth and people can go in and, and find it. Okay. Like my, my grandfather was Thomas Holy from, or relatives are from uh, Little Barisway, right? Yes. And my mother's father was Thomas Holy in Little Barisway, right? Good. So, like, you know, to be able to enter it, like, some of them now are up in age, like, my mother is 92 now, but she might have some inside or something that could well, be added, right? Well, that's right. And a very important contributor to this, I, I mentioned her very early, was Anita O'Keefe, from her personal connection, uh, her personal connect, collection of this, uh, of the early settlers. Uh, Anita does work with the town of Placentia, but a lot of her work on this is, is done independently. 
And Anita, if you are looking for some of that information, uh, a lot of it is, is stored and archived next door, over here, isn't it? in the next building next to us, and Anita's in there, so she has information. She has a lot of information in there. And she was very helpful in letting me use some of this. So, um, I, I, I won't go into each of the codes and in, the information, but there is a little piece of each of the settlers in each of those codes. It would take us from now till um, next year to do that. Uh, but there, there is a write-up, and pictures could go in there as well. They're quite easy to do. And if I may, excuse me while I wrote there, I'm getting copied this example. When you know the suite, uh, my great great grandmother was one of James Hopkins' uh, children, Mary, and she married in the Moon East National Branch. But how good are the sweeping records, or have you seen any, that we can go back to get the actual people who came over? Uh, do you know have you had a chance to look at the sweeping books, or are there any remaining? There are remaining books, and again, they're uh, archived in uh, the Voices of Placentia Bay. Are they not, Tom? Um, the records? of the Placentia and Sweetmans. Actually, I haven't seen those records yet. There's a project being worked on, but I have not known. The letter books? The letter books are available in St. John's. The letter books are available. Yeah, the letter books. Okay, at the archives. At the archives, and you can actually get them. They're copies of the Placentia Library as well. Yes, so uh, also, I think this is something that the uh, Placentia Institute for Newfoundland Studies which is in its birthing process, I think, uh, will, will be really helpful to, um, to be able to store all of this and have it here for all of you so that you don't have to go into the archives. But if you do just, I, I'm sure, in the, I don't know if is working again already this year. Yes, she is. Sure. And if you drop in at the office or give her a call, she'll let you know what's there. Institute. Yes, all of that is available through Anita's office, through the Placentia. And John Mannion's article that you're talking about, uh, we have that on our website, the historic website. Just look up Placentia history. Yes, uh, I showed you uh, Irish merchants abroad, and in that uh, first. Um, if you go into the town of Placentia's website, that that's where I got this link. I that's that, where this link I think came that's from. in the historic website. I don't believe it's on the town. That's on the town website. Well. It's on one website. So I can, if you want the the exact name of that, I can give it to you before before it's I go. Yes, and. Um, uh, I, I couldn't have done this without the support of uh, a lot of people, and uh, Anita, and Michael Mooney, and Dr. Mannion. And I also, if you notice, didn't do a whole lot in Placentia, at, in place names. And I know I'm in Placentia doing this, but I was really flummoxed at how to attack it. <laughs> and I even made a little, uh, because there are so many, and uh, and it, it wasn't just the Irish um, that I was looking at there. Um, but if you look, uh, I call this um, how a farming family from New Bond, uh, County, Wexford, Ireland, created a mercantile fishing business and an Irish culture in Placentia, in Placentia Bay, Newfoundland. And essentially, um, it's, it's sort of a, just a little nugget of how all of this, how all of this. If you read through Irish Merchants Abroad, Dr. Mannion's work, it, there is so much there that's so fascinating. And I had to sort of, even last night, I was wondering, should I put this in, put that in? What, oh, you know, this would help to explain. There's so much in there. I it really needed to focus on this very short little bit. Um, I have also, um, I have also done just a little tiny, uh, I talked about the islands, uh, and the Sweetman firm had fishing rooms, for example, in, in, um, in Great Paradise. Um, 
and, and a retail store. Some of them had fishing rooms and a retail store. Some just had fishing rooms with no retail. Um, and it was one of the four harbors that dealt with the Sweetman's firm through a uh, resident planter fishery consisting of Irish, English, and Jersey planters. So you can, you can see, you can go into Mirashim, um, for example, it, if it's the same thing, you could go to Odiran. The waters around Odiran were cod fishing grounds for the Sweetman firm. The Sweetman firm had fishing rooms there. Patrick Hogan, servant of an English planter, arrived here in 1730 with his large family. So there's a little bit of information, um, and I, I don't know why I got little plus uh, Argentia all the way down at the bottom. I saw that last night. It should go right up at the top. Um, and and um, the Sweetman firm had fishing rooms in Little Placentia, and it was one of the four harbors that dealt with Sweetman firms throughout a, through a resident planter fishery consisting of Irish, English, and Jersey. The other three harbors were Paradise, Great Paradise, and Point Ferd. So all of those little places have little bits of information, but for the whole thing, go to Irish merchants abroad. The other um, document I found through Anita, was, was this one, and it, it's an interview by Jim Travers in 1975 the Memorial University Folklore and Language Archives, who's a cousin of Anita's, by the way. Uh, and it, it talks about an interview, and it's a really quite interesting. Anita might get you a copy of this. It's really a, in a conversational ma um, manner um, with a Mr. Varon, who was uh, one of the last, uh, well, you all know, if you're here from Placentia, Mr. Varon, the last connection to the Sweetman through his wife. And he tells about, he, he says things in here that I find really quite, quite endearing. He talks about um, the vision there was, it was passed down to my Aunt Eliza Power, my father's sister Minnie, who died in 1909, the house, the old Blenheim house located where Jim, Jim's, Randall's deceased brother house. It was built about the year seven. So it's all sort of reminiscing and how you would talk to your grandfather, you know, in, in the language is, is the same. It's a lovely thing. But the number of names from Placentia was almost more than I could, I could uh, take on at this time. But it's certainly worthwhile. It's a worthwhile thing to do, to go in, even if you're just dealing with Irish names. I uh, had intended, if time permitted, um, to, I even set up a little, a little uh, other map called A Closer Look at Placentia. Um, so it would take in all the uh, divisions, as you can see there's nothing in there yet, but I would, I, my idea was to look at Jersey side, southeast, you know, all, all of the different areas and see if I could pick from this interview where, where people actually lived. But I'm not overly familiar with the people and where they lived, so I would need somebody who had some uh, back, background knowledge on that. So if anybody wants to take that over. <laughs> uh, he, um, Mr. Barron talks about a Captain Duty, Warren, Wilcox. Uh, Duty belonged to Placentia. Hayden, I don't know where he came from, either Ireland or Newfoundland. All these were in the Sweetman employ. So there are pages and pages of such conversation. Um, Irish surnames in the Placentia region and the Cape Shore by Nick Kareen. I don't know if you've seen this. This is also available in town. And um, um, apart from just the names that I used for each of the coves, the early settlers, there are more names in here. So that's another really good source. So um, I think just to sum it all up, I'm sorry this didn't, um, uh, the sound and f some of the visuals didn't come up, but I'm hoping you get the idea um, um, of 
how this can be done. It can be done for your own family, it can be done for a community, one small community. Uh, you know, I've seen uh, sort of maps of branch where the, where the powers and the English are settled, you know, so, you know, those kinds of things could be done, and I'm sure in some of the old maps and, and some of the old documents you have in your own house, you, you can find those. And it's, it's a fun thing to do. intentional, but it's turned out that way. I'm sure that story was song. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, it was. Anyway, I, I found that, that that's even the South. I think that's uh, Francois or one of those. And I've been in Francois, it was pretty familiar. So it's, even though it's not the Cape Shore, it's almost like what's happened since. It ties a man to his mood, except for that hundred year gap. Yeah, we got to get the English part in there. Yeah, 
will be on YouTube, yeah. so you can go back and check there. Uh, any questions? I always hate to... I'll refer you to Dr. Well, Manion. <laughs> uh, as you can see, um, I'd, I'd hope that it will be clearer and we could bring in some, uh, particularly the farming area of New Bond, to show that these people really brought skills. Uh, they, they, weren't, um, they weren't without skills. They weren't... Uh, they weren't paid well, and they, but they did bring, um, they weren't poor Irish people, they didn't come because of the famine, they were pre-famine, they came just as everybody, uh, just as we go to Alberta, uh, our men and families go to Alberta, eventually the men, men came, eventually brought over sweethearts, wives and family, or they uh, married somebody's daughter in the next cove, which is probably how Eddie Coffey got from Angel's Cove to Cuslet, <laughs> uh, or or one of his uh, one of his grandfathers. Uh, so um, yes, so they came uh, for uh, economic reasons and more prosperity and to earn a living, and they came from an adventure. One of the really uh, things that struck me and uh, some of the theater people here. Uh, was John Manion told me a story about um, fr from um, from Waterford, from the wharf in Waterford, the men would load their um, sea boxes or their trunks and, and um, boxes aboard the vessel in Waterford on the dock. And uh, then they would um, carry on down the road to uh, board the vessel in Passage East. And on the way, they would stop at a tavern in a place called Cheap Point. So he said, there'd be 5,000 men coming down that road and stopping, you know. And think about it as young men on a little bit of an adventure, stopping, no lambs, no lambs and coke, I suppose, but there'd be an ale there for them, and spend the night and then board in Passage East or Ballyhack on the other side. So, uh, you know, it, it's a good story, it's a fun story, and I often think, oh gosh, that would make a great piece of theater, you know, um, maybe somewhere here, some summer. Okay, thank you very much, and um, thanks for listening. Anybody got any questions? I, I asked and then didn't listen. Well, just a quick one, then. Uh, you mentioned that uh, Sweetman, uh, in the later year, moved down into St. John's and Boston do their mercantile trade. Were there any, did you find any records of who they were uh, doing the trade within St. John's or Boston and might there be books or places to look from that point of view? Uh, I didn't find any. I didn't see any. But uh, if you look closely in, in uh, Irish Merchants Abroad, that document, you may, although I didn't see it there, but I got a feeling that if you look in those ledgers, in, in the Sweetman ledgers, you may find that. Uh, I, I noticed that when I was reading uh, William Keogh's book, there was references to Sweetman, people buying from Sweetman over here, uh, some reference in passing. I didn't pay much attention to it, but uh, there was uh, some, uh, some shopping done, you know, between the southern shore and here. And, uh, you know, uh, one of the uh, major stories, you know, I, I don't think William Keogh is uh, Lady Sarah Kirk in, in Fairyland. It was an interesting story about women and women's work 
uh, who had the largest fleet of fishermen on, on the English shore. You know, so women did some very, very interesting. Uh, the Sweetman women contributed mostly through their dowries and through their marriages. They were very well placed and connected in Europe, in Ireland and the Iberian Peninsula. And their marriages uh, pretty well secured the Sweetman family fortunes over the years. Um, other Irish women, uh, the regular the regular ones who worked, gained uh, quite a quite a deal of personal freedom, both uh, sexual freedom and and personal freedom, and then they weren't watched over by their priest and their fathers, and um, it wasn't easy to get married in those days. Um, so the clergy wasn't always available. So people made made the best of it, I guess, so to speak. <laughs> So, do read some more about that. Very interesting. <clears throat> A quick note for anyone who wants to see it. Richard Walsh's gravestone is quite, still quite visible down by the Anglican Church. There is. Well, thank you very much, Anne. A uh, very interesting presentation there indeed, and a good, uh, good collection of resources certainly available there with the, uh, with the uh, Google Maps. So we thank you for coming out and sharing that with us, with us today. Um, of course, uh, thanks to both Anne and Amanda for coming out and uh, making this Discover Consensus Speaker Series a uh, the reality this afternoon. Let's give them another round of applause. <laughs> Once again, thank you to the Placentia Historical Society for taking the lead effort on the Discover Placentia Speaker Series. It's certainly been a, a great afternoon here today and a great series overall. Uh, Tom, Anne, Lee, and all the, all the crew there. Of course, it's all made possible through uh, the sponsorship of Placentia 350 Incorporated, and that was made possible through the support of groups like Canadian Heritage, the Government of Newfoundland Labrador, Town of Placentia, and a few more. Tom did mention that this event this afternoon was broadcast live on over the internet and will be available in a recorded version, as are most of our uh, speaker presentations over the last uh, last year. And I believe you can access those through PlacentiaBay.ca, and you can get all the links and resources there. Uh, anyone is interested? There are some uh, refreshments. Sorry, Gary, no lamps of coke, but uh, there's still some refreshments available at the back of the room: tea, coffee sweets and fruit. So help, feel free to help yourself before you take off today. And um, thank you for coming out and joining us here this afternoon at the Central Bay Cultural Arts Centre. I want to remind you uh, that today is the day of Earth Hour and uh, the town is encouraging people to take part in that event today between 8.30 and 9.30 tonight to uh, turn off any unnecessary lighting and sit and enjoy the dark and send a message uh, as people around the world take an effort to uh, support Earth Hour and the whole climate change idea. So consider joining that tonight, 8.30 to 9.30 with Earth Hour. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.